Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about what did and did not happen on October the 7th and why it matters and what people are doing about it. Our guest, Arun Gupta, was previously on the program 11 years ago on the topic of Iraqis in California and Professor Petraeus. Arun Gupta is a graduate of the French Culinary Institute and has written for the Washington Post, The Nation, The Daily Beast, Raw Story, The Guardian, and other publications. He is the author of the upcoming Bacon as a Weapon of Mass Destruction, a Junk Food Loving Chef's Inquiry into Taste. We will have to have another show about that one. Arun Gupta, welcome to Talk World Radio. That would be a lot of fun. Thanks for having me on, David. Thanks for coming on. You've got recent articles, I think, at The Intercept and at Yes Magazine about October the 7th and accusations of mass rape. Uh, what, what was alleged uh, to have happened and what actually happened? There are all sorts of allegations. I was actually just going back over the December 4th special session at the United Nations that uh, Israel organized along with tech mogul Sheryl Sandberg. And that was meant to highlight uh, uh, the allegations Hamas committed mass rape. And according to Israeli officials, they got up before the world and claimed 300 Israeli women, um, all the Israeli women who were killed that day, were abused and raped. Uh, and that is, you know, it's it's typical of, of Israel that uh, they would engage in just such an utterly uh, uh, blatant lie like that. Um, so Israel has been alleging for many months that there was this premeditated campaign of mass rape. And, and I, I do want to put this in a little bit of context, that what Israel has really successfully done, uh, their propaganda, or Hasbara, as they call it, um, is, is both it's a very sophisticated and really bad. Um, it, it's constantly repeated by the U.S. media. Uh, so the stuff about the Hamas command and control center under the Al-Shifa hospital, that Israel is not responsible for stopping aid uh, from getting into the camps. The most recent bombing of, of the uh, Rafa refugee camp, that it was a, a tragic accident, then UNRWA reported employees are Hamas operatives. They're all, they all basically are quickly exposed as being false. Uh, and the media never quite says so. It just says, you know, there no evidence has been offered to prove it. And so the stories tend to fade away. But with the mass rape claims, it has been their mo Israel's most effective propaganda to the point that it was recently invoking the specter of sexual violence before the International Criminal Court as to why it should be allowed to continue to genocide uh, Palestinians in Rafa. It, it said the threat of sexual violence, particularly hostages, was one of the reasons for that. And this is a narrative that's been completely false. But I think the reason it's gotten a lot of traction is just the utter cynicism of Israel. It's very effectively uh, uh, mobilized uh, the idea of rape as a weapon of war, um, of Me Too, uh, and I think, frankly, of a lot of women's traumas, right? You know, that when they hear about rape and they see what looks like some sort of proof or hear their stories, and then they're told, believe Israeli women, you know, and all this, because, you know, you're supposed to believe all women, um, there is a tendency for a lot of women and men as well to uh, give credence to what Israel is saying. But the reason this is so important is it is such an utter and complete lie. There is zero evidence has been uh, put forward of any 
sort of rape or sexual violence happening on October 7th itself. There is one Israeli woman, um, Amit Susana, who apparently, who her story is completely credible, uh, that she was sexually assaulted while in captivity. And typically this is how uh, sexual assaults and rape and sexual violence happen during wartime when you have a captive population. Now, the utter cynicism of Israel is that what it is doing is it's taking this colonial trope that goes back centuries, and it basically boils down to this, that savage hordes of darkies are threatening the purity of white women, therefore we must exterminate the savage hordes of darkies. And this has been spoken openly of by Israeli officials, right? Because they don't hide anything. They do not hide their genocide incitement. In the case of the mass rape claims, there are these Israeli Hasbara officials, one uh, a volunteer consultant within the National Information Direct Directorate, and I'll, I'll give you the quote uh, that he says, he, ex he explained, and this is in an interview uh, many months ago, I think it was in November, or even October, in Yadot Arknat, which is uh, this major Israeli uh, daily newspaper. Uh, he and this director, is, it, like, as I mentioned, is in the prime minister's office, right? So this guy is working for Netanyahu. And he said the entire state of Israel was focused on fixing the narrative that Hamas equals ISIS after, after October 7th. And you had all every single Israeli officials, as well as the, the senior most U.S. officials saying that very same thing. Biden said it, Anthony Blinken said it, uh, Lloyd Austin, uh, the defense secretary said that Hamas is ISIS or worse, right? Or they're, they're Nazis because once you get that narrative fixed, then it doesn't become this conflict between two opposing combatants. You have this evil that stands outside of history and the world must be united to completely wipe them out. And of course, then it's just like, who is Hamas? Is Hamas anyone who supports it in, in the minds of Israel? Israel, it's all the people who voted for Hamas back in 2006. So this is a way to justify the genocide. So this official first explained this, and he said, Western reporters did not know what type of monsters we are dealing with. So the gracious men of Zaka, and Zaka is this ultra-Orthodox Jewish organization that was founded in 1995. Their response, their Israel is basically the only state in the world that privatizes um, its emergency services. They are responsible for collecting human remains after mass casualty attacks. They were tapped to do this after October 7th, despite the fact that they do not have any experience and that the Israeli military unit that is trained to do this, to recover remains, to preserve forensic evidence under combat, which was still going on in, in some areas, uh, was told to stand down. So Zaka is sent in, and this Hasbar official says, Western reporters did not realize what type of human monsters we are dealing with. The gracious men of Zaka uh, explained uh, uh, this to them and, and showed them you know, what uh, we're dealing with. And this deepened the legitimacy, and this is the important quote, this deepened the legitis legitimacy of the Israeli state to act with great force. Now, it turns out, and this is my investigations in Yes Magazine um, and The Intercept, uh, I, I wrote a piece about Zaka, and somehow some of my reporting also wound up in other Intercept articles without credit. Who knows how that happened? Um, so in any case, uh, the Zaka, they openly admit to fabricating stories. One of their most uh, notorious members, who was all over major media, Yossi Landau, he was profiled in the New York Times. He said, and this is a direct quote, this is how he said it, uh, we use our imagination. When we go into houses, the bodies is telling us stories. Another Zaka official, uh, Haim uh, Otsmagen, uh, said, the walls, the stones, they screamed rape. 
right? So they are outright saying we are fabricating stories. They have told the most outlandish stories of, you know, Jack the Ripper killing scenes, naked women uh, tied to bed uh, with their organs removed, just the most absurd stuff. And it's, you know, Zaka uh, members are are responsible for all these dead baby stories, stories about pregnant mothers uh, being butchered and their fetus uh, being stabbed or beheaded or shot. It, it, each story is different, right? So, um, but it's they are responsible for all these fake atrocity stories that have then been used by the Israeli government to justify the genocide. And this is why it matters so much because the media have just done such an atrocious job just completely promoting this propaganda. And unfortunately, you know, in I think a lot of uh, progressive circles, uh, it has gained some uh, traction uh, even, which is why Israel keeps flogging it. it. It's, you know, certainly among Zionists, it's it's become an article of faith that uh, uh, rape did happen, that there was a premeditated campaign of mass rape even uh, but the fact of the matter is all the evidence has turned out to be completely false. Israel has over 60,000 video files. There is no photographic or video evidence um, of uh, sexual violence. Pramila Patton, the UN representative who went to Israel, her, her report was completely misreported uh, by the media. Yes, she did say that there were several cases where uh, there were reasonable grounds to believe that sexual violence happened. And in one case, the Amit Susana, um, where uh, she used stronger language uh, saying that uh, sexual violence happened. But the thing is, reasonable grounds is a very low level of proof. It depends on uh, the information and the investigation that can be carried out. Patton was not there to do an investigation. What gets left out of the story is the fact that there is this commission of inquiry that the United Nations has set up up, that has the authority, that has the investigative powers to go into Israel and the occupied territories. And, and uh, the head of that, who is this uh, just one of the greatest jurists in the world, world uh, I think her name is Pele Navi um, from South Africa, um, I might be getting the name wrong, but uh, she openly says, yes, you know, the uh, occupied territories are illegally occupied um, in violation of uh, UN resolutions and that Israel is committing war crimes. So Israel then is just like, they're anti-Semitic. We're not going to deal with them. We're not going to cooperate with them. And so Pramila Patton was said in, instead who had no investigative powers. She was just collecting stories. But even in her report, she says repeatedly, not verified, not verified, these two dramatic accounts, the pregnant mother and fetus, she says, didn't happen. This paramedic who claims he found one or two girls, dead girls, uh, their remains that were sexually assaulted. He said one had sperm on their back. She said it did not happen. And the New York Times, in fact, a couple of months ago, uh, published a report retracting that. That is one of the most common claims. Um, Sherry Mendez, uh, who is who was this volunteer reservist at the Shore Military Base, which was a main war morgue, told all these fantastical stories about genitals being cut off, heads being chopped off, that uh, uh, women were raped from children to grandmothers. She said this repeatedly. Women were uh, were raped so much their pelvises were broken. Haaretz uh, reported uh, recently that uh, officials say there is no evidence of this whatsoever or of any sexual violence um, uh, at uh, uh, that was discovered in the autopsies that were done at the Shura military base. So on and on and on, basically every account has been discredited. And I'll make one final point. There are only 12 sources that account for the vast majority of these rape claims. Five of them are Zaka volunteers who, who are uh, uh, open, openly say they're basically uh, uh, inventing stories. Um, and of the 12, 11 of the 12 are connected to the Israeli military or 
Denver police. Only two actually claim to have witnessed rape, and their stories are uh, either um, they completely keep changing or they're just ridiculously outlandish as to uh, beg any sort of believability. Eight of the 12 have have uh, uh, told fabricate have been caught telling fabricated atrocity stories, right? So this is just one of the biggest and most vile atrocity propaganda campaigns I think that we've seen in modern history, and it's been used uh, explicitly to justify genocide. Arun Gupta, it, it seems like when Israel makes these claims, there are not just corporate media outlets, but governments, including the U.S. government and European governments, that rush out and repeat them and even claim falsely to have seen all the evidence, even when it turns out later there never was any evidence for them to have possibly seen. So President Biden, I believe, claimed to have seen photos of beheaded babies, and it now seems there never were any such photos. What, how did- There were God, never any beheaded babies. How, well, now there are, but- you know, <laughs> Right, exactly. Um, but, yeah, yeah. But, but can, can you talk a little bit about how governments reacted to this particular claim about mass rape and how the New York Times uh, reported it um, and uh, and now about the International Criminal Court, including it in charges against Hamas officials, as far as we know, without the International Criminal Court having a, a shred of, of evidence. Um, it, 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 and, and how do you get to the conclusion uh, that there was nothing there? This is what I hear from progressives. Oh, that it was exaggerated. There were lies. This part was false. That part was false. But there must have been something there to be exaggerated. It can't have been nothing. Well, so th this is why I, I go back to the colonial trope. In, in terms of the governments, yes, you're right. And when we were talking about the Hasbara, that was one of the most absurd, the dead, dead babies. There was all sorts of stories, right? There was a Colonel Golan Bosch, who he said there were uh, eight uh, burnt dead babies, and he stands before the media cameras, and he's like this. I held a decapitated baby with my own hands complete lie. There's another lieutenant colonel who admitted he lied. He said there were eight uh, uh, dead babies and children hung on a clothesline. There was 40. Uh, Yossi Landa, I believe, either said 20 or 40 uh, butchered uh, uh, children. There was a dead baby in an oven. There, Like I said, there were six different versions where the, the uh, of the pregnant mother and fetus story where the methods of killing kept changing and it just kept getting more and more absurd and one it's it's that uh the uh, fetus is dug out of her belly it's decapitated in front of the family and then the woman is shot in the head right it's just like how do you even know that forensically um that this is the, the sequence of, of events it's absurd and so you have officials like joe biden repeating this um he repeats and from the beginning, he was told by his staff, do not repeat these be, you know, beheaded baby stories. They don't look like they're true. But he goes ahead and repeats them and says three times, most recently, like even two months later, saying that he saw pictures of, of beheaded babies, right? So, but I think what's, this is just basically racism and Orientalism. And the reality is, this is is uh, how white feminism uh, works. That's why I was saying it's this old colonial trope. Now, if you go back, I'll, I'll run through this quickly. In, in colonial America in the 1700s, there was this uh, literature called captivity narratives. There was both fiction and memoirs. And uh, the fiction was, you know, white women who are kidnapped by Native Americans, and uh, they usually end uh, one of two ways, uh, with the white woman uh, getting raped or she commits suicide before she gets raped. The memoirs are completely different because what is going on is, um, yes, there is a lot of killing and uh, kidnapping of uh, colonialists because the Native Americans were being exterminated. Uh, but in many instances, there is torture going on. And but a lot of times the uh, white uh, European settlers 
are adopted into Native American society and become full members of the community, marry into the community, have children, they would then get uh, rescued uh, by the uh, colonizers um, and then often go run back to their Native families. In the case of one woman, she did it like half a dozen times. And so the, these uh, the fictional uh, uh, captivity narratives are all about the purity of white women are under threat, but it was never going on. There was no rape of white women. What was going on, there was rape of Native women, right? This is what the, the conquistadors come with. They come with an in Jared Diamond's, you know, uh, title, Guns, Germs, and Steel, wiping out. And But they're also using rape. And under uh, the the laws of, of the church and the court, the king, they were allowed to rape Native women. You see, obviously, the same stuff during slavery, where by law, the slave master had had the right um, to uh, rape Native women. And that, would, that was, you know, really uh, the most important right, because that's how you create more property. But it's also done for sadism, for pleasure. Meanwhile, you have this, like, narrative of these slave rebellions, these rapacious slaves who are going to rape and kill white women. Again, it's it's this kind of like uh, paranoia and panic being created. During Jim Crow, there's the brute caricature of, of the, the just lustful, rapacious black male, whereas white men could rape black, brown, and native women with impunity, and on and on and on. It extends to America's wars. Wherever, wherever the U.S. goes, sexual violence and sexual trafficking accompany it even up to the present with the iraq war at one point uh, in just one moment it was estimated in i believe 2010 50,000 iraqi girls and women had been trafficked uh, had been sexually trafficked to uh, jordan uh, lebanon and syria because we so utterly destroyed their society and so this is what the, the, the exact same narrative that Israel is doing, and it functions the exact same way in that it is covering up its own what's called gender-based violence and sexual violence against Palestinian women and girls. The gender-based violence is completely systematic. So this includes the complete destruction of the healthcare infrastructure. So you have a uh, uh, hundreds of birth complications every week because um, the neonatal and uh, postnatal infrastructure has been completely destroyed. You, uh, Every single baby that is being born now is underweight. You have all these, uh, I think it's a huge number of lactating women, I think over uh, well over 100,000, whose breast milk is drying up because they're being starved to death. There's no menstrual health for these women. There's something like 19,000 orphans, uh, 7,000 and mothers who've been killed, um, and so on and on and on. This is all gender-based violence, but then on top of that is sexual violence, where Israel is invading homes, and I've collected a bunch of these uh, videos of distraught Palestinian women who, as they're walking, fleeing uh, is is you know this these genocidal uh, uh, just savages um, who've invaded their territory, just completely distraught, telling stories about how Israeli soldiers invaded their homes. They would kill often the husband or a father, a son. They would force the women to strip naked. They would humiliate them. Often they would search them, which is a form of sexual assault. Um, in one case, there was uh, Al Jazeera reported on this UNRWA report that still hasn't been released. Israel is kidnapping thousands of Gazans, taking them hostage, uh, taking them to the West Bank um, and Israel, where they're being tortured and killed. UNRWA interviewed a thousand uh, 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 hostages who were released, uh, Palestinian hostages who were released back into Gaza, um, and uh, they were interviewing them. And according to Al Jazeera, which saw the report, among the torture methods they used was uh, sticking an electrical um, stick up their uh, sexual organs. So they are raping Palestinians with um, torture devices. Uh, and we've also seen everyone in the world 
world has seen these photos of Palestinian men being, hum you know, stripped, humiliated, uh, degraded, sometimes often to their underwear, but sometimes naked as well. And this is really no different than ISIS methods, right? So, you know, as 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 the kids say on uh, uh, the Twitters, um, every Israeli accusation is a confession. Yeah. Arun Gupta, we've got just a few minutes left, and I wonder if you agree with me. It seems to me this analysis of this racist colonial ideology doesn't just explain some of the worst sadistic behavior by the Israeli military, but explains some of the acceptance of the propaganda in the wider world in that it's the stupidest idea on its face that rape would justify genocide. It doesn't make the least bit of sense uh, without the racist mythology behind it. Uh, it, it it's, it's not logical, it's not mathematical, it's, it's, it's utter nonsense. Uh, and yet when you talk, if I talk to ordinary people in the United States, uh, they will both say, I'm not a racist imperialist colonialist and well, Israel does have the right to respond to this brutal violence. Um, am I right that there's something of this ideology yeah. underlying there? Well, of course. I mean, and, and how about Palestinians? They don't have a right to respond to the uh, 6,281 Palestinians who were killed in Gaza before October 7th, um, the uh, 16 years that uh, Israel had basically turned it into a, a concentration camp. You know, if, if we're going on that metric, uh, Palestinians should be allowed to kill um you know, I think a, a, about um, three, four, five hundred thousand uh, is Israelis. Uh, oh, I'm being... not going on that metric, and people don't and, know that. People don't know what's been done to Palestine. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I, I think certainly, you know, with with the younger generations, this is the first live stream genocide. And you know, when I was out covering the student protests around New York City, which I just want to say were incredibly hopeful and inspiring. It was a really remarkable movement. Um, these kids were militant, they were sophisticated, they were disciplined, and not that I think it matters that much, uh, they were peaceful. Um, they would talk about, you know, since October 7th, they open their phone and they see this genocide happening uh, live. And, you know, just to go back, to talking about decapitated burnt babies, right? This attack, um, this just brutal, vicious Israeli attack on Rafah, right? Every time there's a ruling against Israel, it, it goes out and commits atrocities. There's one photo uh, or one video of a man holding up this shredded corpse of an infant uh, that has no head on it, you know? So if we want to talk about beheaded babies, um, th there's plenty of beheaded babies all, all over uh, Gaza. Indeed. Uh, we've got just a minute left. I had hoped we would have a lot of time to talk about your reporting on the student encampments. Uh, we'll have to have you back again, um, but I was too interested in October the 7th. Uh, Arun Gupta, where can people keep up with you and follow what you're doing? Uh, so uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Arun Indy. A-R-U-N-I-N-D-Y. I have a substack, Life, the Universe, and Most Things. Um, I'm also a Facebook digital creator, whatever that means. So uh, I do have a few thousand people following me on uh, Facebook where I, I post frequently as, as well. Uh, but my substack, uh, Arun Gupta, Life, the Universe, and Most Things is where I post uh, all my writings and I'm relatively active on Twitter as well. Wonderful. Arun Gupta, thank you so much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you for having me on, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at Talk World Radio. Org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.